Good evening, folks. Uh, welcome to another session at ANPOC. Uh, today is a free masterclass uh, in the domain of digital marketing, and we have a very super interesting topic on uh, organic versus paid marketing, when to use what. Uh, I will shortly introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, let's just give a couple of minutes uh, for people to uh, join, and then we'll get this session started. If you guys have any questions, please put it to the chat uh, chat box. I will pass on the questions to Tom, and we will pick it up uh, as and when it comes in. Yeah. Yes, Omkar. Uh, the session recordings will be available uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, you will get an email about the same. All right. Let's get started. Uh, very warm good evening, folks. Uh, welcome back to one more uh, very interesting session on the Antwerp Masterclasses. Uh, today we have an uh, excellent uh, speaker and host, uh, Tom. Tom, very uh, extremely warm welcome. Uh, what time is it, Tom, on your side? Thank you. It's only, it's only 2 30 in the afternoon, so that's not too bad for me. It's pretty decent. Thank you Perfect. for making the time in your evenings to hear me talk about uh, social media marketing. Yes. Uh, so, this is a complete, uh, uh, you know, open for all, ask me anything kind of a session. So, what we'll do is uh, once I uh, finish introducing you to the audience, uh, we will start picking up questions. Uh, guys, start posting your questions on the uh, chat box and I'll pass it on to Tom. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, all right, so uh, <clears throat> what are some things you're gonna cover today? Uh, the topic, the broad topic is organic versus paid marketing, right? And uh, when to use what? So we will be touching upon topics like when to use what kind of strategy, when does uh, organic serve you better, and when does paid marketing serve you better? Is there a hybrid marketing strategy and what is it? And of course, any other questions that you guys have on your mind, will definitely try and address it in the next 60 minutes. Uh, so here we go, right? So, so uh, Tom is, like you said, he's currently a, the paid social media manager for Cisco across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, in his 12 years of experience, he's uh, worked in you know community management plus different aspects of uh, internet or digital marketing, including SEO, PPC, content marketing, blogging. So a plethora of experience uh, uh, he brings to uh, in today's session. Uh, he has worked in uh, multiple organizations uh, during his career, whether it's EMI or Virgin Media, Sky, several premium league football teams. I'm sure there are quite a few fans here uh, in today's audience, uh, Tom. Uh, a long time ago, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, right? Uh, yeah. have been, uh, he's been running a small blog empire, uh, interesting, uh, which was one of the uh, UK's most popular blog network at some point. Got very, it. Very, very small amount of time, like about a week, we were really big. <laughs> Then we went down a little bit further, but it's, the, the claim is 100% true. Perfect. And that's what matters. Uh, cool. So uh, once again, a uh, really warm welcome to you on today's session. And uh, let's get started. Uh, let me start with the first question, Tom, for you, right? Uh, Great. Oh, my goodness. And, let's go. and we will keep it extremely simple. This is for the uh, newbies in the session, right? What is the difference between organic marketing versus paid and paid marketing? Okay, um, so the clue really, really is in the name. So organic marketing, and, and before we, we get really into this, I'm going to be pretty much 100% focused on social media marketing. Uh, so yes, I do have an experience, do experience, have some experience in search and pay-per-click, but my vast majority of my experience is in social media. So I'm going to be using social media examples and, and basically pulling this all out of social, the social media world. Uh, so let's, let's make sure everyone knows that. So we were good from the start. So in terms of the difference between organic and paid marketing in terms of social, social allows you to post stuff for free. You can set up a Facebook account, a Twitter account, a TikTok, whatever you want for zero cash down. And then you can start posting content, whether you're a person or a company or an organization. That essentially in the, in the world of organic marketing is what you can do with no money involved. 
Of course, these platforms are not out there to be your friend. They're out there to make money. The way they make their money is to allow companies, individuals to essentially get their content seen, uh, to, to kind of generate leads, to get people to websites via a paid model. So if you are putting any money into your social media, <clears throat> if you are paying, uh, pay, paying for clicks, you're paying for reach, you're paying for leads, you are using a, a paid marketing strategy. Um, there are ways in which you can use both. There are ways to use one or the other, uh, but that's the real difference. If you're getting your wallet out and putting your card down into Facebook, into, into Twitter, you're using a paid strategy. Got it. Perfect. And uh, so Pratik already has one question here. Uh, uh, organic marketing is a powerful way for early stage startups. However, getting the target number of customers is a barrier. How can we enhance it for sales? So, okay. So um, I'm luckily, I have some experience in being, I'm currently in an early stage startup as well. So Perfect. as well as working for Cisco, I'm also the founder of a, of, of a brewery. So a very oh. new brewery in the UK. So I'm wearing the t-shirt. I'm doing my marketing. This is my organic marketing strategy. We've got a team. Um, hope you all follow DMC Brewery on Instagram and Facebook. So I can give you some real, real world examples of how we use an organic strategy uh, right now to, to kind of get some customers in, but do other things as well, and to build towards a paid strategy. So one of the things which is nice about starting with nothing is being able to use social media to kind of develop your brand voice. So you can post an awful lot of stuff with zero risk, as long as you're being sensible, and you can really develop what works and what resonates with your audience and what actually builds that audience and what works for them. And you can also discover what audiences might be coming towards you that you don't know about. So using our, our example, we weirdly have a big following in, it's a strange one, in battle reenactment. So people who like dress up in costumes and hit each other with swords, they seem to love our product. It might be because we've turned up at a few of their events, mm. but that really worked for that. They seem to like us. Um, and so we have sort of pivoted some of our content strategy towards those kind of people. We did not expect this. We had no clue this was gonna happen. But using an organic strategy to kind of find out what works, you can do that with zero risk. And as you're an early stage startup, you've probably got nothing but time. You've got no money, but you've got a lot of time on your hands because you know you're you're spending your days and your weekends working on it because it might be you know your baby. Um, so that's one of the nice things you can do there. Yes, the barrier is getting sales. Yeah, we can build a great following. Yes, we can get a lot of comments. We can get a lot of likes. But do those translate into actual sales? Probably not, because we're not reaching a customer base who have not know who don't know about our product yet. So you you kind of need to to generate sales to put money in. So as well as you know building this sort of organic reach, building this tone of voice, we also do paid media promotion as well. Um, but we do know. But the other side of this is because we've been posting a lot of content. We know what works because organic can give you a really good clue as to the kind of content that resonates. You can, you can easily see the best content on Instagram and Facebook because it's got the most likes or the most reach. So if you're looking at you know, keeping your cost to a minimum and finding the, the kind of content that works the best, having that sort of knowledge of what worked in an organic environment can help inform your content strategy mm. for your, your paid. So there are, there are lots of things you can do without spending that cash. But yeah, you are, you're right. If you want to get sales, you know, you you basically have to look at your return on uh, on capital employee on return on average spend, your ROAS, um, and that's going to be a big thing when you're trying to generate, you know, if it's if it's e-commerce, if it's anything which is you know direct point of purchase online, then you can really optimize your paid strategy, and your as that happens, your organic strategy probably becomes less important, especially for e-commerce. Your organic strategy will probably become less about your marketing more about customer retention, customer relationship management, and uh, problem solving. So, you know, and maybe even creating uh, a community around your products. So your organic stuff will diminish in terms of marketing, your paid will really pick up, but you shouldn't forget that the that social media isn't just about marketing and generating emails or net new or return visits or whatever metric you're looking for, but it could also be for customer service. It could also be for um, yeah, brand building. It's also there for, for, you know, PR purposes, because if you are a company who's got a message to put out, uh, people might look at your social media as, as a sort of secondary website. So you can make sure that what you're doing there is in line with your corporate brand standards in terms of, and, you know, things like, you know, events 
and you know what the company is doing um, and the last one is you know if you're a bit further into the uh into your sort of journey maybe your organic strategy is about building your company and getting more people through the door so you can show what your company culture is all about because you know if you are going to be hiring somebody and you know you you want the right people in they're not just going to look at your your website they're going to look at your social media and see how you portray yourself on a day-to-day uh, ongoing uh way because that's a, probably a clearer image as to what the company is like than a website which gets maybe updated every week every month mm. whereas social gets updated every day hopefully so you okay. can get a clearer picture as to what this company is really like so there's lots of different ways to use both so i might have gone off on slight tangent there but i hope that answers the question got it nope that works uh so in terms of social media marketing right sai has a question right what is the best platform to go after is there a best platform first of all the question is the options you have are youtube facebook instagram and according to his experience uh, i guess he's saying ask according to your experience in terms of uh, budget allocation and getting your revenue or sales that's a question i i do not have a good answer to because each company is different each company has different goals has a different audience so to to bring it to a, a slightly bigger example at cisco our budgets are generally split between facebook twitter and uh linkedin so because we are we are basically dealing with business decision makers mm. we are trying to sell you know enterprise level software to people high in their company structure the easiest way to target those people is linkedin they offer a much better targeting uh uh what's the word technology than facebook does for that kind of people facebook's great for mass reach if i want to do a brand campaign bam facebook cheap cheap huge reach easy if i want to target like the cio of a bank i'm not going to use facebook i'm going to use linkedin i'm probably going to use an abm i'm probably going to use some account based marketing target every around that person but my laser focus is on this cio I'm not going to use Facebook. I'm not going to use Twitter. I'm going to use LinkedIn as part of a, uh, an overall strategy. So the answer to that question is that there is no best. It really, really depends on your objectives, on your budget, on your company itself, and a whole range of factors um, that that can can do that. In 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 general, I've used Facebook the most. And Facebook and Instagram, I generally consider to be the same platform because mm-hmm. the ads side of things is the same. Um, I've used because it's probably the most mature and is the most um has the most options is the most rounded platform for doing the most stuff probably cuz it's been out there for the longest um I'd say that's it's probably got the most it's the easiest ads uh technology to use as well if you want to learn anything I'd learn Facebook I'd go Facebook blueprint I'd get into ads manager and I'd use that the most because if you can use that and you go to LinkedIn and try and buy ads on LinkedIn it's the same It's the same technology. It's really, really similar. Facebook's more sophisticated. LinkedIn basically ripped them off and put it out as their own ads platform. Twitter's a bit, bit more different. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd say that yeah. If Got it. Any, thing, any, any comments on YouTube? On YouTube, well, I, I'd, YouTube's part of the Google stack, so I've always considered Google to be programmatic advertising. Mm. Um, it, I would never say that Google, uh, that YouTube is, in terms of ads, an organic, a, a social media platform. in terms of its organic offering yeah youtube is a real social media platform but its paid offering is google it doesn't allow you to do the stuff you can do with social media and if you're if you've got a person who's in your company who's looking at programmatic and buying things via you know double double click that's a year, that's thousands of years old that's right. uh, buying things <laughs> with the google ad stack yeah. then um i would put that in their hands it's the same tech it's the same tech as programmatic only with you know mm, better creative uh as opposed to uh uh something like facebook which comes with all the stuff that you get with organic social so you put an ad out if you put an ad out programmatic you're not going to get a comment you know you'd have to do some social listening to see if people are responding to it whereas if you put an ad out on facebook or linkedin or somewhere you have all the joys of people sharing it commenting on it trolling you asking for a job all the stuff that you get with your organic stuff so I that's agree. i agree that's what i'd i'd look at that. perfect perfect uh so let me uh, continue with the questions tom but in the meanwhile let me just uh, we have a couple of quick polls i mean these are not 
Uh, yeah. Guys, these are not tough questions. These are just simple stuff just to gauge the audience and where they are in the journey. So, guys, you will see a poll coming up on your win on your screens. Just take a couple of seconds. And while you guys answer, we'll go on to the next question. So, here you go. All right. So, you guys should be seeing the question on the screen. It's SEO is a part of paid marketing. True or false? All right. In the meanwhile, while people take that... Uh, Siddhant is asking, could you show us or at least share us what a media plan looks like? <laughs> I don't want to look at Excel anymore. I do it all day. Um, so what does a media plan look like? Essentially, it is a matrix of where you're going to spend your money, how much you're going to spend your money, and when are you going to spend your money. And that's essentially what it boils down to. So uh, that that's you can tart it up, make it look nice, have rationale. Onto, onto what's going on, but that's what a media plan is. And it's usually, it is usually, you know, horrible things. They're Excel documents. They're essentially like a, a map of, you know, the time, how much am I going to spend on Facebook this week? How much am I going to spend on LinkedIn this week? And then you can really break that down into what creative, what tracks, what your objectives are, but that's really all a, me uh, all a media plan is to me in social. That's all it is. I'm sure that the, a media plan for like outdoor or for programmatic might include more stuff, but I, I like my media plans to be to be really simple because I'm not the one who's really digging into that. They're pre presenting to other people to make that as simple as possible for someone who doesn't look, work in media or maybe works at a higher, not higher level, but a higher job grade who doesn't have the time to really get into the details to understand very simply what we're spending, where we're spending it. And the other thing we should be looking at is what the expected results are. How many eyeballs are we gonna get on our content? How many clicks are we gonna get on that content? How many people are we gonna to send to the website? And hopefully, ultimately, how many sales that's gonna generate as well. So right. that's, that's all so it's not It's not just the input metrics that you're gonna track, but it's also the output uh, oh, KPI. Yes. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like media plans that have, I think, because the plat because social media platforms kind of give you an idea of what is expected, they're very, very easy for, for us to put together uh, an expected output. I, I, I'd hope that anyone presenting a social media media plan will have some level of objective setting and ho hopefully have some level of, uh, of sort of making sure that people are aligned onto what can be expected from what we put in. Um, there's lots of factors that de determine whether that's going to be true or false at the end of it, but it's always nice to go in with, okay, we spend $5,000, we're going to get 1 million clicks. Brilliant. We know that to begin with hopefully. Got it. Okay, so here are the results. So 69% people on the audience today got the answer right. Uh, SEO is not part of paid marketing. It's more of a organic marketing uh, exercise. Perfect. Uh, let's go to the next question. So uh, just uh, connecting to that uh, last question, right? Uh, Surbi has a question. Organic marketing is a very slow process and clients are very impatient. How do you go about convincing your client about the progress you're making in an organic marketing campaign? Ooh, good question. And a really hard one to answer because I haven't mastered that one either. Um, you've got maybe this is one where I'd say that if you are doing uh, organic marketing, you really need to manage expectations up front that that is a marathon and not a sprint. If they want to see results straight away, if they want that traffic delivered, if they want those sales made, if they want those leads in, you have to go in with the, uh, the ability to explain that's not going to happen straight away. What you're doing on the organic side is essentially priming the pump. It's creating uh, an environment for your paid marketing to really drive stuff forward or in the, ver in the long term future to be able to drive stuff with your organic. There's no way you should, no one should be expecting that to be delivering any kind of, of great results from, from, the, from the very beginning. It, it, it's essentially yeah, it's brand building. It's, it's creating a new place for you to send your marketing messaging from. It shouldn't be your marketing messaging. Um, it's the same as having a website, essentially. Now, I'd, I'd say that an organic, a well-managed organic Facebook or Instagram or Twitter account is more a replication of your website than a marketing tool. It's mm -hmm. somewhere where people can go as, a, as opposed to somewhere you send stuff. When you start doing paid promotion, then it becomes somewhere you can send content from. Before that, it's, it's a pull. People will go there to complain, to find out more about your company or to check you out. Um, Another an example on this one is I have uh, 
I do a little bit of work on the side. I have a couple of financial services clients. Hmm. So you've got to have a lot of new content up on a financial services social media page for trust. So if someone sees an ad from one of these companies who are saying, we can manage your finances, we can get you a better mortgage, we can you know, sort out your retirement. If people want, are going to give them money, if they're going to give them the ability to manage their money, they should be a very trustworthy company. Okay, so you see an ad from a, a company saying, oh, I can manage your mortgage. You're going to check out their Facebook page or their Instagram or wherever that ad came from before you take any kind of action. If you go there and the last post up there was from 2019, pff, gone, no chance. You've got to keep that stuff up to date or you start losing people who are potential leads. So there are many ways to, to sort of try and explain why it's such a slow process, but that needs to be explained to them. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, great collateral material out there that says social is pay to play. Social is a paid environment. Now it's, you know, there is no more social media, only ads. You can pull that all together, you know, lots of quotes, tell them I said it as well, whatever you need to do to, to convince them that, you know, this is not going to, you can't just put a tweet up and expect a thousand sales. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Right. In fact, the other day I was looking at some statistics where it showed that the organic reach on Facebook itself has been declining over the last 10 years, right? Yep. And it's all yep. gone, going to fade now. Yeah. Yes, completely. Yes. Right. It's uh, it's all, there's, there's multiple reasons behind it, but uh, you know, the model that Facebook put in place was to, was to, you know, acquire followers, hmm. pay for those followers, and then Facebook will show your content to those followers. That worked when Facebook was a smaller environment, when the feed was less prevalent. Uh, but now, because it's a fast moving, you know, it's not even real, it's not even real time, it's algorithmic in terms of what is shown in the feed. Um, that model no longer exists. So, and they have, they've changed that to, you know, restricting the quantity of content shown to users to, you know, big companies that I've worked for, it's 3% of your, of your fan base will see the content, which is, you know, okay when you've got 10 million followers. But when you're starting out and you've got 10 followers, it's not good enough. And that's why, that's why the paid site has become so big. Hmm. Actually, the next question is bang on on the same concept right, from Divyanshu. He's saying, while doing organic marketing, how, how can one find the way to get through the social algorithm to get the maximum reach? You know, to create an image about your brand and also find the right customer base. Uh, yeah, well, again, there's there's multiple ways to approach this one. You know, the first one is just the simple one is create great content. Yeah. What's great content? What works? Um, for your brand, it could be a lot of different things. You know, there's also the, the side of create great content. And even if it is amazing, maybe you're just unlucky and it just does not get shown to the right people. And you've spent, you know, $5,000 creating an amazing video get, that, that gets seen by 20 people. Mm. You've suddenly wasted your money. So I would, I, I would not put any guarantee on organic reaching the right audience. It's it's there to test, it's there to have fun with, it's there to, to throw stuff at the wall. But if you really wanna get, get through, then you do need to put that paid stuff behind it. You've gotta think about, you know, how much time, how much effort, you know, what is your budget for creating content? And then, you know, divide that by the number of people who see it. Then you can work out the real cost of it. If you create that content and then you show it to a million people and then you do that maths again and you divide by the number of people who see it even with the additional spend on top you find that your cost per eyeball really drops down so you need to look at like a 70 30 split between how much you spend on content and how much you spend on on content delivery on your on your paid promotion hmm. um, so i'd be looking at that uh, I, I don't have a good answer i'm really sorry um you know i've created things which i i thought might go viral and uh they didn't I've created stuff which I thought was crap and has literally gone viral. And I've, I've done stuff where I've pulled every lever I can outside of social to get the most eyeballs on it for no money. I've put stuff on television. I've got people to, you know, say the URL at the end of a show and it still doesn't do huge amount, huge numbers compared to what you can do by just putting a little bit of cash behind it. So mm. it's, it's a difficult ask, you know, but I don't say give up, but, you know, consider the fact that the, the social media platforms are now an engine for marketers to get their content to the right people at a pretty low cost. So don't try and beat the algorithm, work with the platforms, work with what they're trying to do to get that content to the right people. Got it. 
Got it. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit here. So this question is from Mansa. Uh, what channels are good for lead generation objectives, specifically for B2B companies? Oh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, 100%. Um, yeah, I, this is this is my day to day. This is what I do. Getting those leads in on on the right kind of people on an ABM list for for Cisco products. We use LinkedIn. It's it's definitely the best one. Um, Facebook also has good lead gen, but I'd, I'd be using uh, in platform lead generation is the the thing we're using more than anything else right now. <laughs> you can you can see our ads. No, it's not a secret. Um, so I wouldn't ever send anyone to a website. To, to create a lead anymore. I'll be using lead gen forms within platform. So Facebook and Instagram, Facebook, and Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn both allow you to capture leads directly in channel. And I'll be running those 24 seven to a wide audience. Uh, the thing I've come to come to realize in this one is no matter how amazing your creative, no matter how fantastic your targeting, if someone is not in market for the product you're selling, they are not in market. You can't do anything about it. But you've got to keep running it. You've got to keep going across the entire fiscal year because at some point, someone is going to be in market for new security solutions. It's going to be in market for you know, new, new routers. They're going to be in market for you know, networking solutions at some point across the year. So keeping that out there and keeping doing it is very much the thing to do. LinkedIn for B2B, because they're targeting, you can target down to a company, you can target to a, a job level, you can target to the right people. I'd say that that's the best one for B2B. Um, we have run stuff on, on Facebook for, for smaller businesses. So we don't just sell to enterprise level, we also sell to small business. Uh, and Facebook's been pretty decent for that one because you they they do have some good targeting there for, for small business uh, sort of general stuff. Not so great after iOS 14, but uh, but LinkedIn, yeah, definitely easy easy answer on that one. Got it. Uh, this one is uh, close to uh, similar to a question that we uh, answered in the start, right, on the social media plan. But this one is from Devesh. He's asking, how do you go about planning your budget for the overall social media marketing, uh, you know, spend? Um. I'd like to do really good planning. A lot of the time, I don't know what my budgets are until like too late. Uh, so you'd always probably have a, a sort of boilerplate where would, based on, on objective, where would you spend your money? So if someone says to you, okay, we need to generate leads for B2B. Okay, I've got a fairly simple media plan for, for generating leads for B2B businesses. And then I can work back depending on how much money I have, how much money I can get, how much money I can cajole people into sending to me to do that. And then based on that, I can adjust my levels on terms of how long it runs for, in terms of how many is expected result, in terms of platform. If you've got loads of money, maybe I can split between Facebook and LinkedIn, but I'd have something ready to go sort of pre-written. Pre Usually your last quarter's media plan is still pretty decent. You don't change huge amounts between quarters. You, you shouldn't, unless you've got something amazing going on. And then you can, you can use that to sort of plan out what's going on there. Um, yeah, I'd start with, you know, what is proven, what's true and tested. First of all, what do you know has delivered good results in the past? And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people can either find good case studies or can find stuff that's been run by their own business, or at least, you know, you know, find a mate who's run something similar and say what's worked and then build that as your core media plan. And then from there, if you've got enough budget to run a test somewhere else, if you've got the idea that maybe we'll get someone to do a dance on TikTok and maybe that'll bring us some leads. We could do that as well, but always have that sort of core, it's gonna work, it's tried and true, we'll, we'll, we'll do it on this platform and run that through. But, you know, always have, hopefully, if you've got the budget to do it, have the uh, sort of back of the mind, what do I wanna test this week? What do I wanna test in the, in the near future? Got it, got it. All right, folks, uh, time for one more poll. Uh, instructions not necessary, here we go. All right. Uh, next question is from Manika. So what are some tips that you use to improve your content so that you can bring as people's attention towards it? Oh, good stuff. So content. Um, this is one of the things that I, I like. I'm, I'm not usually involved in content development. I usually just, you know, tell people what I want and then they can go off and do it. Uh, but I also like, I also do my own I do all the content for, for DMC. If you have a look, you can see some ridiculous pictures of myself. 
Um, uh, what works? It's how do you make content good? Uh, so there's lots, there's, there is a methodology. So one thing that I would always suggest for social is have your brand or at least something connected to your brand in everything you do from second one. If you're making a video, have a little bug in the corner, make sure that your brand colors are there because most people scrolling through social, you know, even the very best content will be scrolled through pretty quickly. If people don't know they're seeing something from a particular company, what have you done? You've, you've sent out a nice pretty picture. And especially if you're putting cash behind it, that's, that is quite sad to see your content, you know, being delivered to the right audience at the right time and it to be completely ignored. That sucks. But even if they do ignore it, if they scroll past it, at least they have seen something that relates to your brand hopefully. Um, other things to do, I, I'm a big fan of video content. I think that social media is, is has, it isn't becoming, it has become a very video centric place to be. Um, I'd say that looking at, at the trends on video on social, don't make anything longer than about 10 seconds. Again, mm. scroll through. You want to capture that interest as quickly as possible and get out of the way because the next picture is going to be of a nice kitten or you know, your mum something that you actually are on social media to see, not an advert. So get in, get your brand in there and get out quickly. Um, and the other, other thing, which is a little bit more in depth when it comes to social content, especially for video, is, is something called heartbeat. So uh, the way adverts work on television is that you sort of build suspense, you build a narrative, an action, what's going to happen next? Ah, oh, there's the brand right at the end. Uh, you know, you have the story that, you know, the people meet, they're having a great time. And what are they doing? They're both having a cup of Nescafe coffee. There's the end. The brand goes right at the end because you've got cap you've captured attention all the way through. You can't move. You've got to wait till the program comes back or the, the movie starts. Whereas social, you don't have to sit there. You can scroll past. So you've got to have that product in very quickly. That's why the brand should be there from the start. But if it's product-based, make sure that product comes in quickly. And even if it's a, a longer video, if you want to really hero your content, you can have the brand come in, a little bit more action, the brand comes back. A little bit more action, the brand comes back. It's like telling multiple stories. So it's heartbeat. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to this rising action, end because you know most people aren't going to get to the end of the video i look at you know video metrics across every company i've worked for and they all start well but about three seconds in whew, they're gone everyone's gone maybe the hardcore will stay to the end but i want that that person who's even seen three seconds of my video to know they've seen an ad to know they've seen my product to be even more familiar with that product and if they they stay on to the end and want to watch the whole thing fantastic if they don't i've still won so that that's some some sort of high level stuff in terms of, you know, static images and things like that, like text overlays, I like. I think that's that's an easy way. If people want to read something presented to them, don't rely on the copy that you're given, the area of copy you're given by the platforms. Put your text in there. Even now, the 20% the ads rule is gone. Thank God. I can put my text overlays on my images. I can deliver a very quick message and get out the way very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that's another one to do. And, you know, the other side is don't, worry too much about high gloss production you know you're in a feed with pictures being taken on crap phones you can live between that you do not have to be steven spielberg to create content i do it with my 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 crappy like android phone i don't even have an iphone so and it doesn't matter because it's still good enough for where it's presented and the place it is presented is on a phone we're all you know i can see people are, are watching this on phones mm -hmm. 80% of social media content is consumed on phones. Remember that even when you're, you're being presented by like a high gloss marketing agency, they might be doing it on a massive whiteboard, PowerPoint, everything. Don't let them do that. Make sure they present to you their creative on a phone to make sure it works on that phone. Because if it doesn't, if they're, I've seen so many stupid mistakes where they'll have text on an image and it's unreadable because it's on a tiny screen. That's where it's actually being consumed. It's not on a billboard. So that's a, another another sort of, that's not how to make content great. It's how to make less crap content, which is probably where everyone should start. Isn't amaz amazing content? Don't make shit. Make something good and then work from there. Because I still <laughs> see really big, really good companies spending money on Tosh. So yeah, that's uh, something. To I, I guess, I guess uh, guys, that's as real as the advice gets. So. Yeah. <laughs>
cool. Uh, Pratik has a very interesting take. I think this is, uh, so his use case is for an attack on niche technology learning, whether it's AI or big data or internet of things and so on for college undergrads. Uh, he has, uh, his question is, does platforms like Clubhouse useful for organic marketing? Clubhouse, you know, I never really got into Clubhouse. Uh, I, I think maybe because I'm, I like the podcasts I already listen to and I don't have much time for another audio thing in my life. Um, you know, I've got three jobs. I don't have enough time. It's terrible. Um, but yeah, in terms of like things which are new for undergrads, yeah, I, I imagine this is looking back a long time ago when I was an undergrad, I'd be jumping on every new piece of tech that's out there just to see if, you know, how does it work? What's this? What can I get out of this one? I wouldn't say, say Clubhouse. If you are marketing to that sort of tech savvy undergrad audience, I'd be looking at anything new. I'd be looking at the newest platforms and just jumping on those quickly because that's probably where they're going to be. I'm, I you know I, I still love Reddit, but you know, that's old now. <laughs> that's super, super old. I still pitch it at people, but you know, back, uh, you know, 10 years ago, that's where I would have gone for that sort of audience right now. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Clubhouse is going to be the new one um, for that sort of thing. I'll be keeping an eye on you know your uh your sort of not buzzfeed what's the what's the blog um uh or whatever tech blogs are out there showing you what the latest uh companies are up to keep an eye back maybe yeah that's the one come on dude sorry i'm talking for a while i'm gonna forget things no um <laughs> uh, i'll be looking at that and and the nice thing about jumping on new platforms is that usually if you're lucky the organic reach is still there they want to get you hooked on their product. They don't want to start charging you yet for getting that reach out there. They want to build a critical mass of users before they do that. So if you're a good content creator, even if you're a mediocre content creator, you can probably get your content out there into those places. In Clubhouse, you know, you make something new, you make something cool, you can invite people onto whatever you're doing. You can, you know, pull their social media into that. You can pull them together and then you can sort of live off the sort of halo effect of that one. But yeah, I wouldn't just put something like that whatever whatever is new to get that audience got it got it uh, Sunil has a question where would you put your money if you're running a brand campaign for an e-commerce or a direct-to-consumer d2c business facebook and instagram depending on the age of the uh the users okay this is entirely in social you know I, I might say programmatic as well for this one but entirely in social i'd go probably if you've got an older audience i'd go facebook if you've got a younger audience i'd go instagram um basically because the prices are good the the tech is good the results are good um and you've got numbers sheer numbers if it's a if it's dtc if it's an e-commerce brand if you are not looking at a really niche audience if you're looking at a wide audience where's the wide where's the widest audience it's programmatic but in terms of social it's facebook it's facebook and insta go nuts on that one go wide and then you know narrow down your audiences to whichever one works so yeah that's a nice simple answer on that one got it uh, okay this is interesting nine is asking how effective is influencer marketing nowadays Ooh, i hate influencers they're the worst i genuinely I don't like I don't like influencers. I don't want to use influencers, but they are effective. I I, I have it's probably because I'm not an influencer. If I was a if I was an a, a, attractive, muscular young man, I'd probably be an influencer, but I'm not, and you know I never was. I'm a weird bearded guy who you know likes ad tech. Um, but yeah, I I think influencers are especially good for for awareness. There's there's not much else they're useful for in terms of what I've. I've seen them be useful, but if you've got a new product, if you want to get it to the right audience, as long as your influencer and your audience align, then you're all right. The worst thing you can do of influencers, and this is something that Shell was guilty of, was using completely the wrong influencers for completely the wrong products. We have, you know, and making sure that there, there is some sort of brand alignment as well. We had uh, one example of an influencer we paid in an unnamed Asian country who was telling people how great Shell Helix motor oils are. Two posts down in our Instagram was a post from Greenpeace talking about you know how evil oil companies are. Now the, the alignment there is completely off. She was paid by Shell to do that, but yeah, you know she's still taking still doing stuff for Greenpeace. So that has to be looked at in terms of 
and look at the following and make sure it's a real following. I, I look at some influencers now and I look through their followers and I, I do not believe in any of their numbers. You know, you've got to look at, you know, their latest post. Are they getting comments? Are they, you know, comments is the one to look at because you can buy likes really easily. Whereas buying real comments is much more difficult. Uh, but yeah, if you want awareness and you've got a good alignment between an influencer you want to use and a product that they would sell and would use themselves, I think that is quite effective. Um, possibly the, the drawbacks here are, are the metrics, are the actual analytics. Whereas with paid media, you know, hopefully, you know what you are spending and the, what results you're getting. Whereas with some influencers, it's basically throwing money down a hole and you're not sure what you're going to get at the end of it. Some will give you access to their analytics, some will not. I would, I would be asking for full access. I'd ask for brand partnership handshake to see what they're doing before I would give them any cash. Um, but yeah, that's a... Uh, Despite my my misgivings, yeah, they they are they are quite useful. Got it, got it. You talked about metrics, right? So, if you had to take a step back, right, the topic is all about organic versus paid marketing, right? Uh, what metrics do you use to keep track? In are they different in the case of organic versus paid? Uh, I mean, my 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 main metric in terms of well, there's I've got two main metrics. One is reach. I think reach is definitely the most important metric for sort of top top of the funnel, making sure people are aware of your product. That's my my big one. You know, I love having lots of likes. I try to get away from that mindset that oh, look at all the likes I'm getting. That's amazing. Nah, it's reach. Reach is what's important. I need people. I need eyeballs rather than love because eyeballs might convert to sales. If someone's taken the time to look at my ad and then go and buy something, they might not have liked it. If they've liked it, it's probably they haven't bought anything. That's the problem. So I, I think that reach is, is your main top funnel uh, objective to track. You know, the, the difference between, you know, organic and paid reach is ridiculous. I, you know, I work in millions when it comes to uh, paid reach and I work in hundreds when it comes to organic reach. So it's really hard to, to compare the two. Um, but in terms of like actual metrics on the end, it's about, you know, probably off platform uh, metrics are the ones to track. So is it generating sales? Is it generating website visits? Depending on your company on what they're doing, what is your actual end business goal that you're looking at? And how do you ladder that back up to your actual metrics there? Reach is great for awareness. That's, that's an easy translate. But when it comes to, you know, e-commerce is a nice easy one at bottom of funnel because you can go money in, sales made. When it comes to, you know, a company like a B2B company where you're looking for leads, it's money in. Um, uh, uh, leads, so you can you can pull that one together. When it's an uh, completely offline, which is you know, I spent a lot of time at Shell, where people don't usually buy petrol online. Weirdly mm -hmm. enough, they buy them in service stations. The disconnect is really difficult, and trying to figure out how much has gone in and how much that's influenced someone to purchase. You've got to do things like you know brand lift studies, uh, you know get your Nielsen's and your your people like that in to find out whether it did make a dent because it's very difficult. And you know the last thing on this one is mixed media. If I'm doing a, a paid social campaign, if I'm doing programmatic, if I'm running paid search, if I'm doing a big SEO job, if I'm running outdoor ads, if I'm running all of this, which one actually contributed? And figuring out exactly what part of that journey my channels played a part in, that's difficult to do. It's not, not entirely impossible, but it's approaching impossible now when we're looking at a, you know, a cookie-less world. So I guess it's not as simple as putting UTM links. Yeah, not, for when you, not when you're trying to sell petrol. <laughs> you, can't do, you can't track a UTM <laughs> to a petrol station. We, all, we almost found a way for it, but it's very, very difficult to do. There is, mm. there is offline tracking for, for Facebook. It's, it's there. It is difficult to implement at scale. You've got one shop, you can probably do it. Mm. If you've got 40,000 shops, yeah, it's, gonna be, it's, it's almost impossible. Got it. So this one is, uh, <clears throat> the next one is actually pretty interesting. I mean, uh, so Rohit is asking, uh, a lot of experts suggest, I uh, know you should do omnipresent or omni-channel marketing. Uh, but as an audience, uh, or at least from an audience perspective, consuming the same content in different formats and different platforms gets repetitive. So how do you plan the content when you're trying an omni-channel strategy? Ooh, um, so 
That is, that's a good question. And one which probably doesn't have a great answer. Um, in terms of, this is, I'm looking, I'm assuming this is like an organic way of doing this as opposed to paid. For right. paid, you'd probably focus on one channel. You wouldn't run the same ads on Facebook as you would on LinkedIn. You would 100% tailor that to the audience being, uh, right. being marketed towards. So if you're looking at this as an organic one, one of the issues here is usually budget and, and amount of time and resource you have. You probably don't have enough time or uh, resource to create individual pieces of content for each channel. So you do use the same one across all of them because you're hoping that the audience on one isn't the same audience as on the other, isn't the same audience on another one. At least I do and I have because I don't have the time or, or the resource to do that. In an ideal world, I would be creating you know different formats, different sizes, different creative for each channel. But without that, it's really a, a case of you know what can I do to reach the most number of eyeballs with the lowest cost and that is usually reusing the same piece of content across mm. the channels it works for, which, you know, not ideal, but real. That's what the real world, you know, sort of does for you. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about people seeing the same content in two places. If they see your content on Twitter and on LinkedIn, you know what? Well done. Fantastic. You've got a great fan there. And, you know, you need to see a piece of content. What? What's the, what's the number of times before it really resonates? Five? So if they have seen it on both, I wouldn't worry. They're not going to complain. You're not spamming them. Mm. It is okay. I mean, it would be great if it was tailored, but it's fine. I wouldn't worry. Got it. Perfect. Wow. The questions are not stopping, Tom. I mean, I got some <laughs> 2,500 questions here right now. We're at 45 minutes into the session. Oh, no. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. This one is more towards a career in digital marketing. Let's take this one up. Uh, so Anand has a question. Do you think digital marketing as a sector is saturated right now? If yes, how do you think a digital marketer could stand out from so much noise? Good question. Uh, I would not say it's saturated right now. I'd say there's probably uh, a, a lot of a lot of demand for people with the good skills to to get into into di good digital marketing roles. I think that the the industry is is still growing. I think that there is probably uh there's there's there are some there are some skills gaps i think there are a lot of people out there who are amazing technical experts in what they do but can't explain what they do very well so people who can really get who can get into ads manager and just kick the ass out of the ads and make them work amazingly but trying to explain what they've done and explain that to somebody up the chain you know your marketing you know your vp they're usually not very good at that and then you've got people who can talk the talk but when they get into ads manager and and that sort of technical side of things they're not so good either they're not so amazing at that i'd say that combining being able to do the work and that you know in terms of paid social is uh is the sort of ads manager side of things it's the sort of being able to set things up create a pixel create custom events uh create you know how do you upload a one percent lookalike audience all of that kind of stuff that is techie but also to ex explain that, to be able to talk it through, to, to sort of show the value of what they're doing without being boring, first of all, because it, you know, you, I could spend ages talking about how I set up an audience uh, for one campaign and, you know, how well it worked. Nobody wants to hear that. They want to just know about the results. Uh, and yeah, and, and having that sort of dual level of skills between tech and talk. So yeah, having that sort of sort of thing. So in terms of being able to stand out, I mean, if you are early career professional, this is this is going to be quite a, a crowded marketplace. There's probably going to be not huge numbers of roles and quite a lot of people who are able to do stuff. So I'd say that the, the way that I'd hire and the way I have hired is, is to look at what people do, you know, not for fun, but what their sort of side projects are. You know, are you, if you tell me that you are, you know, you want to work in an e-commerce brand, all right. Have you set up an e-commerce brand? Have you created a Shopify? Have you connected that to a Facebook page? Have you sold a product? Have you created, you know, you want to work in publishing? Have you written a blog? Have you written many blogs? Have you, you know, created a podcast? All of this stuff is well within easy reach. It's not expensive. You know, you, you can start Facebook ads buys for five pounds. It's not huge money. You can set up a free WordPress. It's free. If you've got a good sort of background in what you do, you can you don't have to intern 
you know, you can set up your company from, you know, your, from your front room. You can set up your, from your bedroom, from a laptop. So as long as someone has, has demonstrated the ability to work without being told what to do and maybe show some technical savvy, basically by, you know, really enough, watching videos and going to, you know, webinars and things, they'll learn stuff. That, that would make people, that would stand out to me as someone who's been a hiring manager. It's, it's the initiative not to just go to school and go, I've got a degree in marketing. Yeah, great. Exactly. Show, I mean, me what, I, show me what you've done. Yeah. No, I think uh, you pretty much, you know, hit the nail on the head there, right? Um, uh, I'll just take a minute here to explain to folks what we are doing at Antwalk as well as a larger movement, right? Uh, exactly what Tom was saying uh, just a couple of seconds back, right? It's not just about learning from the book or the videos, right? It's about putting it to action, right? So... At Antwerp, what we have done is we have brought in a lot of professionals just like Tom and at least 300 more digital marketers who have worked with different brands in the last 10 years and they have come and contributed with content, real uh, experiential content, right? That they have learned on the job. You know, they have been there and done it. Uh, so that's our first philosophy, right? Learn from practicing professionals. Second is learn by doing, right? You know, focusing on practical hands-on knowledge and not just the theory and the frameworks and finally since it's an online world nowadays everything is you know, on zoom or uh, cisco or microsoft teams right uh, it's not it has to be a live immersive classes because there was a lot of advantage of going to the classroom there was a discipline there was uh, the learning was immersive so how do we bring that back into the online world right so what we have done is we have created programs especially in digital marketing where you know where folks from different industry working professionals are going to come and teach you guys it's a 16-week program not only you get to know the practical stuff but like Tom was saying you will execute real world projects right now my cohort is running a Facebook live campaign this week on how to get leads for Antwalk for their cybersecurity program right uh, next week they are going to be designing a a real life landing page using WordPress and Elementor as a tool. So you will get your hands dirty, right? So if you guys are interested, if you guys are looking at a career in digital marketing, I would suggest please check us out, uh, sign up. The links are in the chat box. Uh, one of us will reach out to you. Of course, there are some great discounts going on. So do check it out. Yeah. So uh, I will quickly get back to the Q&A. We have another 10 minutes remaining. Uh, so Tom, uh, Question for you next is, uh, for a startup with less budget and targeting one entire country, okay, very specific question, is Google Ads with a medium tail keywords uh, which have high competition or should we use organic? All right, you're going, you're asking me, you're asking me search questions. Oh, my search <laughs> knowledge was, was good, I'd say about about maybe eight years ago. So eight year, eight year ago, Tom would go, would probably not be giving you a good answer either. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna back out this question. I'd say hopefully AMWAC will have some great search and Google people in the future to answer that question. Definitely. I couldn't give you a good answer. I'm no sorry. worries, no worries for that. Uh, Shubdeep has a question, right? Can we go for organic marketing for a few months and then shift to paid? in order to balance your budget is this will it be helpful um um depend again depend on company dependent on, on objective um in in terms of like if you're an early stage i'd say that you probably shouldn't be looking at your paid stuff for about at least a good two months i this is not proven by anything this is me saying what i think has worked i would i would always have like two months of content already built up of backlog of content before you start with your paid promotion on, on your social channels. Um, in terms of, are you basically saying, we're gonna back out, we're gonna do paid, and we're gonna drop out, and we're gonna come back in, we're gonna drop out. Well, a lot of companies work on a campaign basis. They don't work on an always on uh, paid strategy. I prefer an always on strategy. I always think there's somebody in market. I always think you should be talking to your customers all the time, but not all companies work like that. A lot of them will have you know, what's the summer promotion? What's the Christmas promotion? So I think that it is it is definitely uh, viable to do it that way, especially if you're if you're low on budget and you know that certain times of year are more likely to get the right kind of customers through the door. 
So, you know, there are some companies who won't do any advertising until, you know, Christmas period because they only have that kind of product to sell. So, but they'll keep things on for the rest of the year. So, yeah, I think that's entirely, uh, entirely good strategy. Yeah. Got it. Okay. This one, uh, this one's interesting, Tom. I mean, uh, this is more around the, uh, you know, how do you manage your uh, stakeholders in the organization kind of a question, right? So, Here's the question from Devesh. Deep down from your gut, you know that campaign, this particular campaign is going to work, but your superior or a manager is not into it that much or not convinced. So what should I do? Should I drop it or keep on convincing and pitching? Um, uh, a real world example from me, I just did it. Um, I, I had a I dotted line to a, a higher management person who said, no, you've got to do it my way. He was dead wrong. He was 100% wrong my way was going to work. So I, I literally, I thought, I, I, can, I can take the heat if, if this does fail, it's not going to fail. And it didn't. I got, what well, I got 4,000% uplift in number of leads delivered because I knew what I was doing was the correct way of doing it. And his methodology of running a full funnel strategy was completely off. He should have been running one objective and it'd been fine with the budgets we had. Give you some more background on that one. So I, I have been, yeah, using the philosophy of forgiveness is better than permission, especially if you're pretty sure you can get those those results. I know this is this is often often a cultural thing. Certain in certain countries, you you do have to do exactly what the boss says. In some places, you do have the, and this isn't not not by way of by nation, but also by way of cost, company culture. Um, I'm lucky at Cisco that I have pretty much autonomy to do what I want to do. I'm trusted as an expert in my field to, to take objectives and go, this is the way we're going to run things. I've been doing this for a long time. I know what I'm doing. But, you know, there are some places where you have a, a playbook and you don't go outside the playbook by fear of death. And that's how it works. And those companies usually don't do as well. <laughs> you need to give that sort of autonomy to people to do it. So I'd say, you know, if you're feeling brave, run it and you know beat them to death of the results if you're getting getting better results than what was promised because you know what you're doing then you know you've made yourself a hero and if you, you you'll usually know what within about you know once the learning phase ends depends on how much you're spending but hopefully you'll know pretty quickly whether this is working or not and if suddenly you realize this has not worked you can pivot pretty quick and go, well, put in the budget the back the way it should work. We're going to put it this way. So hopefully you can, you have a, you'll have, you have that sort of get out clause that you can remove yourself from the situation, put it back to how it was and, you know, blame it on, oh no, we got hacked. <laughs> no, don't say that. That's terrible advice. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be brave. I mean, what's, what's, you know, you, what's the worst that can happen? You, if you do get fired, you've got a great story as to why you got fired. It should, you know, make you definitely hireable. Got it. All right. I hope uh, uh, you got your answer there, uh, Devesh. Uh, last couple of questions, Tom. Yeah. Uh, this one is more on the, the future of marketing, right? So Nayan is asking, are AI and 360 degree campaigns the real future of marketing? Ah, the AI. I, um, I've used some products that promised me AI ad level optimizations. Yeah, they sucked. They they weren't they weren't good. They they didn't see the nuance. They didn't see uh, a lot of. And I don't believe that they're AI. A lot of this isn't AI. It's a, basically a big Excel document that goes, oh, this one's doing the best. More budget goes to that one. That's that's how AI actually works in a lot of these cases. They just call it AI. Um, but I you know AI is getting you know increasingly more sophisticated um, to the point where I. I am slightly concerned about, you know, if I just drop in my creative and my objective, is that all I have to do? Is, is that it? And then hopefully something will come out at the end and show me how amazing it is. I'd say that we've, we've probably got a good five year window before the AI gets good enough to actually run a campaign properly. Um, but the AI can't talk to a manager. AI can't moderate comments. AI can't look at creative and know, you know, or AI can't decide on where we're going to spend the money, which platform. AI can't do all of this stuff. AI is going to be very helpful for doing uh, implementation, but it's not going to be doing very much for for planning. I don't think. Uh, I think it'll be it'll be a tool. I mean, you know, we used to have to you know send a man out with uh, a van to put posters up. We can now put stuff in front of people. It's 
on computer screens are amazing. I think it's going to be a sort of a move towards that. It, the, the general media planning will continue to be the same way as it has. I think the way that we operate in sort of a high level will be fine. I just think the tools down at the bottom of the implementation will probably get more sophisticated and better. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the external environment out there changes very quickly. We, you know, iOS 14 came in and kicked all of my campaigns up the ass and changed everything. Uh, we're going to see the same thing from Google in the future. What's the next thing that we as marketing people have to get ahead of and make sure we have plans for? AI can't do that. We're not too worried about that kind of thing. But I have that sort of thing in my sort of back pocket. Uh, keep an eye on it. Keep an AI on it. Uh, very funny. Uh, before it gets too big, and make sure that you you know you are aware and familiar of those products, so that you can say, oh yeah, I I've I've looked into you know I've A/B tested Sprinkler versus my own ad optimizations, and you know mine were still better. That kind of thing can be done. Got it. That's perfect. I think that's the perfect close to the uh, session. I think uh, thinking looking into the future of marketing. Uh, wonderful session, uh, Tom. It was a very, very fast paced session. I still have at least 20 questions here, unfortunately. Oh, no. I can't pick them all up. Uh, but I think it's uh, for the next one then. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll, come, I'll come back, don't worry. Definitely. Get someone, get um, someone in to answer the, answer the programmatic and search questions. <laughs> no, no, no. I've got someone from Cisco who could do it. Got it. No, we'll do that. We'll, uh, yeah, we should maybe do a fireside chat and get you guys to fight between the organic and the paid marketing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks again for the time. Uh, guys, yeah, let's nice. give a thumbs up for Tom. Uh, and uh, it was a super engaging one. We will be bringing him again. And uh, like I said, if you guys are really interested in a career in digital marketing, do check out Antwalk's 16 uh, week program. And uh, there is a ton of stuff you will learn hands on with experts extremely extremely experienced like you know tom uh, so thanks again for coming on uh, uh, you know uh, today evening and uh, we will see you again on the next set of sessions there are quite a few coming up in the next week do check it out and sign up if you haven't already thank you guys and thanks tom again thanks for the time it was a great session no worries thank you guys for, for listening and thank you for the questions cheers cheers bye